system science. In systems. Period. In systems, period. <laughs> but that's an example point, and he's, he understands so that. So I, I, would, I would go after that. I mean, this talk isn't directly about that, but it's indirectly about that. It's sort of saying that one of the core issues in this is whether or not uh, systems is a science that can be understood from a scientific point of view or it needs an engineering point of view. And I'm obviously saying it needs an engineering point of view. Okay, so yeah, so this, uh, uh, the background of this, this work is really trying to get clear on what an engineering worldview would look like rather than a scientific worldview. Because scientific worldview, there are all sorts of assumptions about symmetry and conservation and stuff like that that don't, just don't seem to connect with reality. And, uh, and the complexity science and so forth has been struggling with this, but they haven't got anywhere. Well, I shouldn't say that. They got a lot of places. Okay, so uh, the systems engineering worldview, my thesis here is that reality is completely intelligible only in terms of a participatory systems engineering thermodynamics view, worldview. Uh, the structures and functions of reality are technological creations. And a corollary thesis is that reality as such is never completely intelligible in terms of any possible scientific worldview. Okay, so the intro teaser uh, for a colleague, uh, George Billyrell. And George uh, argued that the engineer should be taught that, uh, that uh, uh, engineering is a natural extension of biological evolution. So we are, and it is, and, and engineering practice is a natural extension of biological evolution. And uh, I want to say this is not a new view. Uh, it's there in Plato, uh, Plato's Timaeus. Uh, talks about uh, an emerging, the emerging design of the universe, which comes from the architecton, which is usually it's sometimes translated demiurge. Demiurge is a public worker. Uh, architecton is the you can say the architect, but the, ar the arch tecton is worker, so architecton. And uh, in, in, on the Stanford uh, analysis of this stuff, uh, their their uh, Wikipedia thing. They translate the uh, architect on as a master craftsman, and I'm going to argue to you that that's basically the engineer. Uh, okay, so a strategy of five steps that I'm going to go through. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to what I take to be the modern engineering uh, worldview, which is represented by mostly a bunch of engineers. And then the uh, I'm going to go into the, what's called the uniformitarianism debate, which is about Lyle and Cuvier, which is kind of very illuminating on this issue of whether or not the world can be understood scientifically or it's an engineering enterprise. Okay, and then I'm going to look at the metaphysics of can the historical sciences be reduced to the hard sciences, basically, and the answer being no, of course. Uh, then a little bit about what's involved in that. Complementarity is crucial and the testability of how can we test this question? Is Can we demonstrate that the engineering uh, view of reality is right and the science one is inherently uh, limited or incomplete. And one of the things is, besides uh, uh, Plato's treatment of engineering uh, worldview, the other really neat area that where this came up that I've been kind of found my way to is the, uh, the 17th century uh, and the origins of engineering thermodynamics, or engineering dynamics, if you like, and this comes from Leibniz and then develops in Carnot. And then eventually I'm going to bring us back to, uh, having gone through that, bring us back to step one and link it to the engineering guys. Okay, so again, George, uh, the Aurelius master engineer himself, and uh, so he argues that uh, all of evolution and emergence is a progressive, recursively enabling engineering enterprise. Uh, and it gives an idea of our place in the systems reality. One of the things about systems engineering is that we're inside the system, and uh, there's a distinction between the spectator view and the, and the participant view, and they ask slightly different questions and so forth. So I think this crucial again to distinguishing uh, the system science from systems engineering. Uh, system science talks about Sometimes we want to look at it inside, sometimes we want to be outside, but it's sort of like arbitrary. 
And I want to say the reality is better to start from a participant where you actually, anytime you're dealing with any problem in the world, you are a participant in the world and you should be thinking yourself that way. Now, so here, extension of my thesis here. So if the, if the world is an engineering enterprise, then it's composed of embodied technologies. And I'm going to say they're intelligently structured and functioning. And uh, intelligently structured, as you'll see, just means that the parts, the parts whole relationship is an engineering relationship. And it's not, as some system science people think, it's just causal this and causal that. And we look at all the causal relationships in the system. Now, what the elements of the, of the system are different. So the example is human body, or at least fish, the dog, everybody. Uh, but they're also active. Now, there is all these different uh, embodied, intelligently structured uh, technologies that are embodied uh, are also active. In other words, they can do things in the world. And this again, crucial thing. So here are some more examples. Uh, everything basically is uh, embodied technology. And the, and the Earth itself is an embodied uh, technology. So one of the key guys, I'm going to talk about the modern engineering worldview, a key person here, seminal uh, book called What Engineers Know and How They Know It, Walter Vincenti. He was an uh, aeronautical engineer down at Stanford. And uh, uh, he says, uh, modern engineers are seen as taking over their knowledge from scientists and by some uh, occasionally dramatic but probably intellectually uninteresting process uh, using this knowledge to fashion material artifacts. And uh, he goes, uh, he says, from this point of view, uh, studying the epistemology of science should automatically uh, subsume the knowledge content of engineering. And then he goes, hits you, and he says, engineers know from experience that this is this view is untrue. This is a basic challenge. I call that challenge, engineering challenge to science. So he goes on. He says, engineering knowledge is not derivative from science, uh, but is an autonomous body of knowledge. Engineers, engineering is not merely applied science. There's a big dramatic change in engineering education now. They were, engineers were just generally taught that's that's who you are and what you are. You're just applied scientists. So he goes on and gives an example. So he's an aeronautical engineer, so he tries to stay in those examples. He says, Air, airplane, uh, airplanes are not uh, designed by science, but by art, in spite of some uh, pretense and uh, humbug to the contrary. Uh, the creation, uh, the creative, constructive knowledge of the engineer is a knowledge uh, needed to uh, implement this art. And he says, engineers understand technological structures and functions in a way that is beyond uh, scientific knowledge. In other words, the way to put this is if you could construct an airplane simply by uh, deriving it, so to speak, from, from scientific laws and principles and so forth, then that'd be great, but you can't. This doesn't work. So having constructed an airplane, the engineer understands how the airplane works in a way that the scientists don't and never will. Okay, so. Uh, his engineering epistemology, theory of knowledge, in, entails or suggests then that, that reality, the ontology, what the world's made of and how it's composed, uh, is also corresponds to this engineering epistemology. So the world's made up of things that have been created. Uh, 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 per hypothesis, let's say you got to is, the best image of the engineering ontology is the engine. Uh, incomprehensible from within the conservative scientific framework. So the, the contrast here again is between uh, science, which is conservative, and engineering, which is generative. Engineering actually creates things. It's net productive. The change in engineering is net productive. Okay, so this is some of the, again, examples of technologies that would correspond to what uh, Vincenti is talking about. And it applies quite generally. So cities are technologies. Um, Houses are technologies, neighborhoods are technologies, uh, governments are technologies. Uh, now one might wonder whether these are really intelligent, but as you'll see, what I mean by engineering intelligence it, it captures this idea that it's that uh, you know engineers are make mistakes and they have to like they're sort of blind. They're not they don't have this preset intelligence that tells them what to do. They have to find it. They have to discover how to do these things. 
Okay, so the second guy that I think is uh, the third guy is Bugliarello Vincente, and there's a third guy, uh, Sam Florman. And Florman wrote this wonderful book called The Existential Pleasures of Engineering, and he really gets the existential characteristics proper. So uh, he goes into European ex existentialism, and the, the existentialist mantra is uh, here we are instantiated in reality, we have the ability to do things, uh, but we don't have any script. <laughs> we have the ability to act, but what are we supposed to do? And the Europeans are like, oh my God, there's no, the Pope isn't telling me what to do. What am I supposed to do? And how to worry? I mean, I'm lost. Who am I? Really? So, but Florida says, this is nonsense. So he said, in the United States, what this says is, as an engineer, I have options. I can do that. I can do all sorts of different things. And I sometimes say, I'm not being graded, you know? And so one way to put this is we have a constrained free will. It doesn't mean we can do anything. But we have options. We always have options. So even though we're constrained in all sorts of ways, we have the ability to do, choose, and do different things. And uh, he says what this is is a creative opportunity to actualize future reality. Okay. So when we encounter reality, it is partially indeterminate. And it's for us to make decisions that will bring, bring this about. Again, I just mentioned that this is, you find this in Timaeus. He says, I can only give a probable account of how the world came to be as it is. This was the question that was put to Timaeus in the dialogue, is how did the universe come to be as it is? So I'm going to give you a probable answer. The reason for that is that it's not a deterministic process. Okay, so uh, fourth person in this is uh, Herb Simon, which hopefully all you guys know about. And Herb is an economist, but he also talked a lot about engineering and problem solving. And so if, if, if um, Foreman's right, and we, we have this existential character to, you know, how are we going to work in the world, what, what is the engineering agenda? And what he says is, it's the problem of design. And uh, there was a speaker, I can't remember his name, that was the head of the National Academy of Engineering, and some, somebody in the audience after his talk said, uh, gee, I know what scientists do, they go, they, they're to discover what engineers do. And he says, whatever they pay us to do. Well, this was, a, <laughs> this was not the right answer. Uh, and that was, that's one of the big changes that's come about. Uh, the idea that engineers actually have their own agenda and they are actually doing something in the world, about the world, and uh, they're not just doing uh, whatever someone pays them to do. So, and, and Simon, this is kind of a tautology of what we mean by problem solving. He says we're trying to move from a current state of affairs to a more desirable future state of affairs. Okay, and I want you to note in this that there's a value component more desirable means to a more valuable thing. So, and one, again, linking back to Timaeus, uh, one of the things that Timaeus says, he says, oh, I can only give you a probable account, but one thing is for certain, he said, it always moves to the good. Okay, now, this is why I'm just going to mention this briefly. So, one, one of the ways of capturing the design concept is to say, well, so how are we going to design, how should we design, I'm going to put should in there because that's the value point. How should we design the irrigation of our fields? <clears throat> How should we design our houses? How should we design our neighborhoods, our cities? How should we de design our businesses? How should we design our economy? How should we design our political system? Well, at that point, you're kind of a Plato's Republic. Question: How should we design this? <laughs> and the big, a big change, I think, for me, a lot of this has picked up already in Silicon Valley, and this is an example of that. This, this the article, this is, they say to my philosophy friends, of course, you read the Harvard Business Review, so they don't, of course, but uh, this is the cover of the Harvard Business Review, maybe a year ago, and it talks about the evolution of design thinking. And the key to this is, is all of a sudden, managers and everybody, you have a question? So this idea of design, which is very interesting, so this is a, this gives you a sense of the, of the engineering approach to these things. Uh, how to design things. And the Harvard thing, and what's happening in Silicon Valley, a lot of it is in terms of what's called now innovation policy, but the uh, this idea of evolution design thinking. So it used to be, just like this, this guy said, uh, what engineers do, well, whatever they pay us to do, and this realization that everybody's an engineer. So if I'm designing a business, then that's a design question. Mm -hmm. And this one, there's a couple of books on this guy, a really nice book called uh, a more beautiful question, kind of Warren Berger, which goes into this, and 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 the thing is that uh, 
one of the questions at the end of it is, I'm designing my life. I mean, how long? How much time do I spend with my children? How much time do I spend getting exercise for health? How much? Those are design questions. So everything that's going on, all these questions are design questions, and that's since we're all engineers and we're all making these engineering questions. So goes the argument. Okay, uh, really great book by uh, uh, Kevin Kelly, who was the founder of Wired Magazine. These guys, interestingly, these guys are not academics, you know, which is sort of unfortunate. I mean, some of the guys I said it before were, but so he had a really wonderful book called What Technology Wants, and highly recommend it. I would have preferred the title What Engineering Wants, because that's what he's really talking about. And this other thing is making the world work better. This is an example of the engineering attitude. That's what we're really trying to do as engineers. This was a kind of a history of IBM, I think, ultimately. Okay, so uh, now why this matters for you guys in system science, or what you think is system science, which is isn't a great So the question is, is it system science or is it system engineering? What I'm going to argue is that engineering scientific models uh, have deterministic futures. And engineering models have open existential futures. So I have options I can do. And, and the options are not predetermined. Uh, they're qualitative and open. Uh, and so systems engineers are intelligent agents operating in an open, emergent intelligence system. So if you're what you're doing as a system engineer, uh, if you're even thinking you're in system science, you're not really. Uh, you're operating a system that is itself intelligent, and you're an intelligent agent in an intelligent system. Uh, system engineering is not merely applied science, uh, given corporate policy and so forth. So, uh, system science is a value enhancing enterprise. So, one of the things about the engineering idea here is that it, it incorporates values. I mean, when I'm trying to move from a current state to a future state, it's a future desirable state. That's, a, that's, that's about value. So what happens in the engineering framework is that the humanities and the, and what we previously thought of, the humanities and science is a big division, supposedly. They're actually together. A lot to say about that. Okay, now what I'm going to go into here is the uniformitarianism debate, which is one of the things I've done a lot of research on recently. And it's, it's really interesting because it's the uniformitarian position is the scientific position. And then there's the counter to this. So uh, the focus of the debate really is can reality be uh, completely understood in terms of a uniform systems, if you like, scientific worldview. And Lyle, this guy, uh, Charles Lyle, uh, says yes, and Cuvier, who's my hero, says no. And Cuvier's alternative is, in fact, a systems engineering worldview, as I'm trying to point out. Um, this debate illustrates the relationship and the debate between the scientific and engineering approaches to uh, worldviews. Okay, so there are two issues that, that come up. One is about time, how did the world come to be as it is, and then the other one is the spatial thing, which is not really understood as the ontology. How is the world organized? So how did the world come to be, but how is it organized at the same time? What's it made up of? What are its parts? How are those parts related to each other's world? So the chronology of the Earth, how did the Earth come to be as it is? Uh, that was, which was Timaeus's question, is it a uniform process or is it not? In the ontology of Earth, is it, is it uniform? Is, is everything just flat and uniform in the world or not? Uh, is there are there structures and functions in the world? And so ontology, if you guys are not familiar with the term, is just basically components. So Lyle's uh, big, hugely influential principles of geology, the subtitle is most interesting, an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. And, and, and Lyle, what Lyle wanted, it's quite legitimate in a way, Lyle wanted was to have a scientific law governed geology. And what this came to, we realized, was it meant he had argued that their same processes and the same laws uh, work over time and location. So, um, and this in the modern scientific physics, for instance, you'll see that people say, well, well, the laws governing the universe at the beginning of time, the laws governing the universe now, they're actually identical. Uh, the, the, time, the laws governing reality and the scientific worldview are the same at the beginning and the end. Nicely, uh, Lee Smolin, if you guys are familiar with him, is challenging this. Uh, so time, space, and variance is the argument. Now, uh, one of the earlier uniformitarians, really interesting guy, actually, uh, James Hutton, uh, came up with the idea that the that the planet was a dynamic cycling system, and uh, so uh, 
this idea of Hutton's paradox is really interesting. Because one of the things is that Hutton, what motivated Hutton to go to the cyclic view was that uh, he felt that if it was like this entropic thing, oh, the universe is all going to zero or to nothing, and it's heat death, and everything's going to die. What's the purpose of life? Nothing. So he didn't like that, and he goes, like, it must be that the universe is cyclic. It must be the world is cyclic. And he wanted a stable Earth for for uh, humans and habitation, so we could go for it. But anyway, he uh, he did push for this idea that processes operating today are the same uh, everywhere in the past, and therefore this is, this is one of the mantras: uh, the present is the key to the past. Present is the key to the past. So if you want to understand what went on a billion years ago, you just look at what's going on now. It's the same stuff. Maybe not. So Lyle's uh, uniformitarianism, he goes, uh, he argues that the geosphere is, a, is in a steady state. And this is a cycling thing. So, so there's uh, volcanoes and, and earthquakes move, uh, bring things up in the water and everything takes them down. And this is a continuous cycle to nowhere, as he says. It's going to, not going anywhere at all. It's just a cycle. Everything should have looked the same uh, at every era of time and everywhere you look at. Okay, so um, so it's geological uniformity of time. I just said it's earthquakes, so forth. Uh, same structures and functions, if you like, over time. That's what he's arguing. Uh, and, and it's uh, not anyway, It's really fascinating here. His book, how he explains away all the uh, differences and stuff over time. And he said they're only apparent, and, and often they're due to, to uh, sampling bias, as he argues. So if you look, obviously it's like the the forest and the trees, you can see, well, all these trees are different. Well, if you just go a little bit and look at the forest, you don't see any differences, right? And as I say, like, one of the, uh, one of the uh, things I was struggling with a few years ago, and John Barrow, who I'll refer to a little later, uh, was arguing to me that the cosmos is actually, if you average everything, all the matter in the cosmos, it's really enormously uniform. It actually is. I said, well, John, what about the stars and the galaxies? And so he said, well, they're not really, they're just illusions. That's kind of, that's the kind of argument that Lyle makes. I mean, John didn't make it seriously. He was just pointing out that this is a, um, a consequence or an implication of this uniformitarian science. Okay, so quick reflection. I want you to do a little thought experiment. It seems to me that every place in this room, every place in the planet, location, space, has a uniqueness to it. Okay? And I also say that every moment in time, has a certain uniqueness. Not totally unique, but a uniqueness. So this is this ends up this is something that Leibniz went for. There's, there's somehow there's a uniformitarian aspect and there's a non-uniformitarian aspect. And that's just the normal intuition. Everybody kind of like, of course, it's not totally uniform. It's not the same day every day, not totally the same place all the time. So, and this then brought me to realize that this was this was Parmenides and Heraclitus. So if you guys haven't been familiar with so Parmenides says uh, we can speak and think of what exists, only of what exists. And what exists is uncreated and imperishable for as a whole and unchanging and complete. It is what uh, it is not, nor shall be different since it is now, all at once, one and continuous. So this is the idea of everything's one. This is like totally uniformitarian uh, ideology. So Heraclitus then so I'm going to read the rest of this. Or, or how could it be? How could it come into being? It, it came into being. It is not. And if it is going to be in the future, uh, nor is it divisible since it is all alike and there is no more of one place uh, than in another to hinder it from holding together. So this is, argues that, there's a whole series of arguments about this. The Zeno's paradox has come off this, off of Parmenides' position too. Anyway, so Heraclitus responds to this. He says, he says, no man ever steps in the same river twice. Where it's not the same river and it's not the same man. So he's saying every time you step in the river is a unique event, and you are a unique person, you know, slipping in the river. So nothing is, everything is becoming. Nothing is what Parmenides says it is. He said everything is becoming, changing. Now, there's nothing permanent except change. Day by day, what you choose, what you think, and what you do is uh, who you become. It is in changing that things find purpose. So this just like, well, hey, this is what the uniformitarian debate is about. At least Lyle is, is pushing the Parmenidean position. Okay, but I, I, I want to point out, because it, it makes this clear, I'm not going to be saying that 
that Cuvier is pushing the Heraclitan position. Because Cuvier's position is the broader one, the one who's a common sense. So there's a little bit of difference, a little bit of sameness, and everything. That's Cuvier's position, as we'll see. He's not a Heraclitan. Now, a really brilliant stuff, as I've gone through this, so Steve Gould, who is, I still think, one of the great uh, philosophers of science and philosophers of biology and all this stuff, so he, his first article he ever wrote in 19, 1965 was entitled, Is Uniformitarianism Necessary? Because he says he's a geologist, he gets his PhD in Harvard in geology. So he distinguishes two different things, a, a methodological version and a substantial version. I'm going to read these to you real quick. Uh, so, um, Gould says, the uniformitarian principle assumes that the behavior of nature is regular and indicative of an objective causal structure in which presently operating causes may be projected into the past to explain the historical development of the physical world and projected into the future to, for the purposes of prediction and control. Uh, in short, it's, it involves the process of inferring past causes from presently observable effects under the assumption that the fundamental causal regularities of the world have not changed over time. Okay. And he says, the assumption of spatial and temporal invariance of natural laws is by no means unique to, bio to geology, since it amounts to a warrant for inductive inference, which, as Bacon showed nearly 400 years ago, is the basic mode of reasoning in empirical science. Without assuming this spatial and temporal invariance, we have no basis for extrapolating from the known to the unknown, and therefore no way of reaching general conclusions from a finite number of observations. Now this is really strong, it's really, it should find a little disturbing, because it sort of says, well, unless uniformity is necessary, then science doesn't, can't really work. Well, I'm going to be arguing science doesn't really work, so I'm not worried about that. And there's the second. Uh, so, uh, now this is, uh, I'm a big fan of, of uh, pragmatism and, and one of the founders of pragmatism, Charles Sanders Peirce, reflected on this as well. And, and I don't know, it, one of my things that I always got hit with in grad school, I write an essay uh, explaining, uh, you know, that number one, that science works with inductive inference, and yet inductive inference is not uh, justified. <laughs> it's not logically justified. Uh, so, ooh, wait a minute. So Peirce says, well, the point is, is that the missing major premise, so if you had a major premise for induction, that major premise would be, uh, to make it deductively valid, would be a uniformity of nature. So he's, saying, he's pointing to the same thing. Okay. So now, this is where the, the, the uniformity debate really takes off. There's this canal digger, William Smith, and he's cutting canals all over the United Kingdom, and he begins to see these geological strata. And they're all over England. Anywhere he goes, and he's saying mostly four of them. Uh, strata. And then Smith <coughs> puts forth this principle of faunal succession. And when he says the discovery of organic remains uh, peculiar to each strata. So what he's saying is he's seeing this progression so that fossils in one strata and the more recent strata, the more recent strata, the more recent strata are more sophisticated in some sense. Okay. So that's, that begins this sort of thing. Now, the, the other uh, uh, non uniform guy is, is and I'm going to spend a lot of it. He, really does a lot, Buffon, uh, he, put, he suggested there were historical epics. He also questioned uh, the uh, uh, fixity of species, which was quite radical at the time. And Ernst Meyer comments, he says, truly Buffon was the father of all uh, thought in natural history uh, in the second half of the 18th century. So he's a big deal. But I want to go to Cuvier. So Cuvier is my history hero here. And Cuvier was studying while all this stuff was going on in England with, uh, with uh, Lyle and uh, William Smith and everything. Cuvier was studying, he was French, he was studying the, the uh, fossils and strata around Paris. It really turns out, it turns out that it's very rich, all this, this strata around Paris. Anyway, uh, Cuvier thinks he discerns a trend in the fossils in the successive strata. This is sort of like, he's really looking at fossils, not just fauna. Um, um, and he thinks there's a trend, again, towards more sophisticated structures and functions over time. Um, and this is one of the launchings of modern paleontology. And he postulated a progressive, emergent, historical, biohistorical chronology. Emergent is really important here because emergent means that it's not mechanical. In other words, that one uh, uh, set of fossils is not 
necessarily leading to the next process. Somehow it's an emergent process, it's not a mechanical process. Just like Vincenti uh, saying, building the airplane, not a mechanical process. Okay, so, now, so one of the things that happened in the debate is, at the time there, before these guys were taking off, there was this, all this stuff about the great flood from the Bible and, and the blood, it was this catastrophe and everything, and, and Lyle didn't like that whole catastrophe. He was trying to say, no, we want regular, nice, regular uh, scientific geology, and so he was really against that. And, and he didn't use the word catastrophe. I can't remember who actually invented the word catastrophe. It, was, it became a, a way of uh, uh, stereotyping your enemy. <laughs> so and they called him catastrophist. And some people think that Cuvier was a catastrophist. He was not a catastrophist. And an analogy for those of you who know about Thomas Kuhn and the structure of scientific revolutions, that I would say Kuhn's revolutions, which are saying that when you learn, you, you, it's a step that's not a logical step. There's somehow a qualitative step there when you actually advance your knowledge. So he's not a catastrophist, and I don't think either Kuhn or uh, Cuvier are properly classified as catastrophists. Okay, so in advancing, so uh, Cuvier advances comparative anatomy of fossils. So he's looking at all these fossils, and he's really analyzing their, their structures and everything at the time. And he, one thing he's impressed with is the functional unity. So all the different parts of the of the fossil fit together in just an incredible way. And this is a, if I like, a systems, functional systems way. Uh, each part contributes to the whole. And this is not just, uh, yeah, this is not the parts whole relationship that you find in systems science, I would argue, which is causal. This is a different kind of systems. This is a different kind of uh, part whole relationship, which is organic. And he would call this, I'm calling it an intelligent parts whole relationship. The unity of mutually supportive structures and functions uh, enables, uh, and what, what he concludes is it enables reconstruction of the whole uh, fossil from a few fragments. And I don't know if you guys, there were some big <laughs> goofs about this, but the, uh, a lot of the fossil uh, dinosaur guys, you just give me one part of the dinosaur, I can reconstruct the whole dinosaur. What are they talking about? Well, this is what they're talking about. If there's this intelligent structure, then if it's this, then it has to be that. And a good example, he gives a couple of good examples of this. So, if, if you find that the fossil has uh, its, its feet or hooves, or cloven hooves, then you know that it wasn't grabbing things to grab. It's a, it's a grazer, okay? And you're finding something that's grabbing things, well, maybe that's a meat eater. So you can see there's, again, this link between the structures of the fossils and their lifestyles, their intelligence. So there's an intelligent link. So they have a certain structure to their to how they see it, it has, has its unity to it, but also is linked to what they're doing in the world. So, um, now he follows a methodology of Galen and, and Harvey, um, which is to say to understand uh, structure, consider the function, consider its function, uh, its purpose. So recall Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood. He discovers these valves in the veins. He's just looking at the anatomy. You have these valves in the vein, and they, they are one way, so that the circulation can only go one way. It can't back up in the vein. That would be kind of disastrous. So he realizes then that the circulation must be one direction, which was fundamental to the discovery of the blood. And he discovered that by realizing that these structures must have a function. Okay, so, and so let me put it as there reasons or purposes for these structures. So there's a teleology in here, right? having a teleology having to do with purpose. So there's a purpose of these structures, there's a reason for these structures, and I would say the purpose reflects an intelligent reason for it, in fact, a value. It's valuable to have these various parts of the organism have different values to other parts and so forth, serve different parts. Okay, so uh, the intelligence of the technological structures and functions reflect a teleological, purposeful trend. Uh, reasons, uh, reasons are values for something. So what, what Kupier sees is actually a, a trend towards uh, value and purpose. Okay, so they're getting more, better and better purpose. And uh, so he postulates uh, uh, an improving teleological trend uh, is what identifies Kupier as an engineering world, with the engineering world. Because engineers are trying to make world better, better, better. So if evolution shows us better, 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 it kind of links up to uh, Guglielmo's argument that 
in fact, uh, evolution is an engineering enterprise. And recall uh, Simon's claim that to move, what engineers do is try and move from a current state of affairs to a more desirable future state of affairs. It's, it's a more valuable uh, trend. And in the Timaeus, uh, Timaeus says, he said, well, I can only give you a probable detailed account of how the world came to be because it had many possible past, but he's always moved to the good. So one thing is certain, he always moves to the good. So I was trying to improve. Okay, so chronologically, Cuvier sees a progressive teleological parameter of biogeological uh, evolution. Better structured designs, uh, and I'm going to just speculate here, uh, reflect increasing functional capacity to do things. Okay, and Cuvier begins uh, to imagine the Earth's, and I was mentioned, he's a buddy with Lamarck, and Lamarck sees this, what he calls this, this escalator of, of uh, evolution. Lamarck had other problems, but he still sees, he definitely sees escalator. So, and ontologically, um, Cuvier begins to think about the Earth itself as a system. And his other buddy is Alexander Humboldt, which you guys probably know about. And Humboldt, um, goes all over the world and starts to realize that there's an dependence of, of organisms on regional specifics, temperature, soil, water, etc. In fact, there are mutual interdependences of different organisms. Some organisms can't exist, exist in this particular environment unless there's a other, these other organisms are there that are mutually supported. Now, this leads then to, say, modern Gaia theory. So this is the Earth as a system. And, uh, been marvelous in biogenics. But, but, uh, so Humboldt gets extended, and, uh, and uh, uh, Lovelock argues that uh, the Earth is an intelligent developing system. He, the, the scientific community hammers him for this. Say, oh, how could you think that the Earth is, a, is an evolving, intelligently evolving system? You're an idiot. So he turned, I think he turns out to be right, of course. But there's a great book, which I recommend, uh, by Michael Roos called uh, The Gaia Hypothesis, where he goes through this the history of how it was rejected, you know, continually, <laughs> and uh, it turns out that like Lynn Margulis, who published some of the first stuff in, in English, turns out her husband was uh, was Carl Sagan, and Carl Sagan was the editor of, a, of this particular journal, and it was Carl that allowed them to get it published in the first place. I remember my daughter was taking uh, AP Biology, and, and, and in her textbook, they had a three or four pages in the beginning in a different color of paper. So why do you think we should mention this guy? We don't think it's science, but it's kind of interesting. So, I mean, that's changing a little now, but this is, again, an issue. Is Gaia theory a scientific theory or an engineering theory? I think it's, it's an engineering theory. It's not a scientific theory. Try to make sure the sense of Gaia in terms of science, it doesn't work. Okay, and uh, Lynn's uh, son, one of them, Dorian Sagan, and uh, Eric Schneider, who was a buddy of, uh, at Harvard with uh, Google, uh, argue that the evolution of the planet is like the evolution of an engine, the engine of the biosphere. And you got the whole thing on it. So the biosphere is an engine that evolves progressively, uh, generating this increasing capacity to perform work. So the Earth, the engine of the Earth can, is getting better and better and better at um, the capacity to perform work. So as, as all the organisms and as the ecosystem gets, it evolves, it's getting better and better and better being out of being able to do things. That's qualitative things, perhaps more than quantitative. Now, just the metaphysical considerations, th th this debate between Lyle and Cuvier is between a cosmology, and co cosmology things are fixed, same laws, beginning of the Big Bang, end of the universe. But in cosmogeny, it's co cosmogenic. In other words, that it says that the universe is actually developing. Okay, and a bunch of people, Lee Smolin again, has talked about this. Uh, so one question, can you reduce the historical sciences to the hard sciences? I asked Steve Gould this one time, he said, no way. <laughs> yeah, so uh, can you reduce uh, these historicals to uh, uniform time invariance? In other words, can, can you uh, give an account of history in terms of mechanical laws? Answer, no. Uh, and uh, ontological particulars, you know, why is Wayne there? And different people here, all these different unique things. You can't account for those in terms of mechanical point of view. So, uh, and this comes out of the metaphysics of particular in general, and it's real quick. So if I still take Galileo and I, and I drop, uh, drop the problem, if I did it in 16, whatever it was, in Pisa, and I can do it here in Oregon, it's the same, same experiment, right? Mm -hmm. 
In a sense it is, and in a sense it isn't. And that's where I think yeah, it's the same, but it's not the same. So, uh, so we kind of want to say, we're going to throw science out. So, and that, and that's what Kuvier doesn't reject Lyle. He just goes to a more general perspective. So the, the presuppositions of the mechanical or cosmology are symmetry and conservation. That's what the physicists won't get. Symmetry and conservation, time, space, invariance. They got uniformity in time, uniformity in space, transitivity, and their thermodynamics is mechanical, it's static dynamics. Any of you know about Neuther's theorem? It's the, she captures a lot of that. So, and the presuppositions of the cosmogenic research program are quite different. You have an emerging, emergent uh, engineering metaphysics. And so it's thermodynamically, it's far from equilibrium. Uh, it, it's generative and it's net productive. Uh, chronologically, historical and cumulative. Ontologically, structural, as structures. Uh, Non-transitive, irreversibility uh, is one of the properties of that. Okay, so the consequences of this metaphysical research is what I was talking to you about, Wayne. And that is, the engineering research program is underappreciated by the scientific research program. So the scientific research program, just like Parmenides doesn't appreciate Heraclitus, uh, the scientific view, point of view doesn't appreciate, well, change in general, and, and the engineering point of view. So this is one of the reasons that engineering, systems engineering, has not received its due uh, recognition in 20th century and even long before. So I would say likewise Cuvier remains underappreciated within the modern scientific research program. Uh, Vincenti and all these other guys same. Even though they're putting out brilliant stuff, it's just, it's just the scientific community just ignores it. I, I was reading John another one of John Barrow's wonderful books called The Artful Universe. He says in there, he said that this whole idea of multiple universes and all that stuff, he said it's just a way to avoid talking about fine-tuning. And fine-tuning has to do with all how would we actually demonstrate this, that, that, that science is limited? So this is all my PhD stuff, and it's, it's captured in my book that I, that I published. So one of the things that Popper asked, Popper was bothered by ideologies, and they didn't they ignored counter evidence, seemed to ignore counter evidence. And Popper's question is, what evidence, if it were to occur, would lead you to abandon the core defining presuppositions of your research program? That's pretty deep. The earlier Popper was like, oh, anything go, you got any negative result from your, from your, theory and you throw it out. That's not true, because you always you always just find ways to rescue your theory. But the deep question is like, well, what evidence would, they, would force you to like, say, no, this is not, it doesn't work. And it's not that it's false, it's that it, it, it turns out it's incomplete. So the surprising answer, as I, as I frame it, is uh, that you need to you need evidence of a formally complementary phenomenon. So if I think the world is all about particles, particle content, or something, what I need to demonstrate is some phenomena, <clears throat> like electromagnetism, <laughs> that cannot be made sense of in terms of particles, or vice versa. Okay. So those are, these are complementary physics. So uh, Popper's concern was, with, he called it pseudoscience, but it's really about ideologies. People are just taking one point of view and thinking everything fits in that. And uh, is uniformitarian an ideology? I think it, treat, it, it acts like that. Uh, it's this you know, science inductive, everything's inductive. Uh, so again, how to test Popper's question. Uh, what evidence would occur? I've said that already. Okay, so and the guy I think who really came up with the answer was, was Lakatos. And he really goes through how how uh, uh, theories are rescued by uh, what they call auxiliary hypotheses. And, uh, okay, I'm just a pop for it here. So, uh, I want to argue because quantum theory is an, it interpolates two complementary scientific metaphysics, so it's particle physics and wave physics like Newtonian stuff and Maxwellian stuff, that quantum theory cannot be understood as a scientific theory. It's a big debate with people. Whoa, it's quantum mechanics. It's not mechanics. It incorporates two mechanics, but they're not, they don't work together. They're not derivative from one larger function. Okay, so I think it's, it sort of clarifies Feynman, Feynman's remark that nobody understands quantum theory. What he really saying is that no one understands quantum theory in a classical scientific sense. He's absolutely right, because it's not. Okay, so Lyle's program, likewise, trying to explain away, you know, like it's like Maxwell's trying to explain away particle phenomena or vice versa. Okay, so this leads me to this wonderful book by this guy, Batterman, and the devil in the details. And Batterman says, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we're convinced that science is incomplete, the scientific approach to things is incomplete, you 
honor you. He said, we need to be asking different questions. He said, university civility are not explained in the presence of uniform eternal laws. Then we need to ask different kinds of questions about how to make sense of the ongoing systemic emergence of stable technological structures and functions in reality. So at least uh, engineering. Okay, so I'm into step four now, real quick. Uh, so you see, let me go through this. what happened to the scientific research program? Because it has not fared well. Um, and, and quantum theory and relativity and so forth. Although you keep, keep calling it science, just like systems people keep calling it system science, it's not science. So, and, and uh, so I kind of got away with this. You go through the books on systems theory, and it's a lot of talk about linear and nonlinear. So, we go, oh, we had this revelation, there's nonlinear phenomena. And they all work together. Linear and nonlinear are, are complementary. And the nonlinear stuff, you go, oh, this is chaos, or is isn't wonderful. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff about chaos, are really nice. And um, the other obvious thing is, let me really look at thermodynamics a lot, is that, it, that scientific laws are reversible, <laughs> time reversible. They're all that, and I'll admit that. And they have no way of accounting for irreversible processes. But everybody accepts that, that everything's irreversible in time. There's unique moments in time that are not mechanically determined. So this is my, my Einstein, you know, I guess I, I don't know, my time's going on. Okay. So Einstein says, physics is an attempt to conceptually uh, conceptually to grasp reality as a thought independently of its being observed. This is the guy, he has the observer outside the universe here, which is typical of Einstein. In this sense, we speak of physical reality. So in pre-quantum physics, there was no doubt how it was to be understood. In Newton's theory, reality was determined by a material point in space-time. You get this from here, because Einstein's criticizing Newton in terms of absolute simultaneity. The only way you can have absolute simultaneity was basically everything happening at the same time. As if they have the same place. So Newtonian reality becomes a, a material point. He says, in Maxwell's theory, uh, by the field in space and time, and the other one, he said, and basically it's the opposite. Everything's distributed. There's, every place you go in space is a different time. Every time you go in time is a different space. So there's, these are absolutely complementary. I, I talked to Hawking about this. He goes, yeah, I think you're probably right. I talked to his friend Kip Thorne about it. He says, yeah, we've been in practice. That's certainly what we do. I talked to Freeman Dyson about it, he says, absolutely. These are complementary space-time frameworks. They're complementary symmetry principles in the Newtonian and Maxwellian thing. Anyway, Einstein says, and, and quantum mechanics is not so easily seen, which is obvious to me. Okay, so Gould comes back with a second hit. And what he does is he starts looking at, he realizes that there's this, for Darwinian theory, you have to have this chance component. You know, how do you have this chance component in this universe that's governed by universal laws? Well, it doesn't make any sense. So he points out that if you re-ran uh, biological evolution, what reason do you have to believe that it's going to come to the same thing? It's absolutely none. And my mantra is, if you can't predict it in principle, how's it going to happen? Then you certainly can't explain the outcome by the same theory. And this is nonsense. So in the neo-Darwinian default, is to say, oh, well, you know, we don't know what the Biological evolution, just like geological evolution from the opportunity, is a path to nowhere. So, so are we going somewhere? Is it progress in evolution? Well, if you press it, the modern Darwinians on this, they say, Couldn't you just substitute the path to everywhere? No. Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> we have one place. We're only one place. So, well, the, the people who want, you know, what is it, the uh, multiple universes, you can play with that. But, so evolution has simply changed. You can press it and go like, oh, well, what is parameter of evolution? Well, it's changed. Uh, you know, changed in nowhere. And basically, the reason is they don't have any explanation of that. Now, and uh, John Barrow goes after the same thing. He builds on Gould's thing. And he says, wait a minute, we have all this stuff from quantum theory. And we have a chance component of the universe. So he said, and he talks about the constants of nature and stuff. He said, we ran the, you ran the universe. We have no reason to expect. I think of the... 35 or 36 uh, fundamental parameters, like 28 of them, they're just empirical. They have no reason to believe what they're one, one way or another. And so he goes, he says, if you can't predict these in principle by your theory, then you're surely not going to use the same theory to explain them. Okay, so this is my system science versus system. So uh, uh, George's, or uh, Wayne's friend, uh, George Mobus, is. Uh, just reading his book, he, he, he argues that system science is a meta science. My argument is not a meta science, it's a 
no function. If you had a function there which you could derive the two uh, mechanics from, then you could say it was a science, but it's not a science, because these are complementary uh, derivatives, uh, and so they don't they don't fit together in that way, so it's it's gotta be something beyond you know something. And the other thing is reading Mobus and, and this other guy, a systems thinker, and there's a whole series of these. And the thing that struck me about it is nothing in there really about design, or if it's just added in. It's, oh, the design of the system. It's not got that core question. What is the design? Why are we going to design our fields? How are we going to design our cities? How are we going to design? Design is not fundamental to these presentations of system science. Okay, so. Um, Sean Carroll, that's by far the most likely state of any universe is equilibrium. So what Sean Carroll says is like, okay, given our physics, what should the state of the universe be? Or any universe like this? Should it be completely in equilibrium? It's not. So we have no, because we're, our theories, add-on theory says, well, entropy goes off in one direction. We don't have any reason to believe. How did we get a universe with low entropy? Okay, so entropy is always going up. Then how do we get a low entropy state? The answer is we don't have any answer for that. And this goes on. I mean, it's just like embarrassing that these guys are still pushing this stuff. It's literally embarrassing. And they, they still, and they go, oh, multiple universes. So, and, and, and Barrow takes another step. He says, oops, if you, he says, if you uh, add up all the electric charges in the universe and all the motion, you know, equals mc squared motion, it all, it's all adds up to zero. I said, so I said, John, I said, John, the universe is nothing? I should, I said, should I worry about this? <laughs> I said, I said, yeah. So you forgot uh, to add the phrase in theory. Well, from the theory. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah. I, I asked him. I said, well, Woody Allen was worried about the universe expanding, and and uh, Manhattan was expanding. I don't know if you saw that movie, but anyway, and I said he was really upset about it. it turns out. But anyway, so these are these are real counters to the uniformitarian idea. So this is my friend uh, Peter Atkins, who's great, and he uh, has <laughs> this great wonderful book called Conjuring the Universe. So he says, people have been worried a lot about how do you get something from nothing. He said, well, he said I have no difficulty in creating the universe, ex nihilo, out of nothing. Uh, nothing. Because the universe is nothing. See, John Barrow said, because it adds up to zero. There's nothing there, okay, according to the basic theory. Okay, now this is no history of this, I'll go through. The, the, the evidence for the Big Bang was a major embarrassment to the uh, scientific worldview. Fred Hoyle like made fun of it. He's, the Big Bang, he, called, he he's, comes up. He was a radio interview, and they talk about he, he parodies oh, the Big Bang and everything. And so that took that name. People picked it up, but it was like it's not a Big Bang. Like, so he argued actually for a steady state. So as the universe expanded. And it went off the edge of time and space. There would be more matter created in the end. Didn't it work out? And and uh, Steve Weinberg in his in his wonderful first three minutes goes through. And he, the universe is actually a history of symmetry breaking events. Now, it's not some the universe is symmetric all the time. Symmetry breaking. And what he concludes in is the universe is non-uniform in time. Okay. So uh, my argument is we need a, a meta problem shift here uh, from from the limited science for general systems, and again, I say from the spectator idea that we're outside the universe looking at this objective world out here, it's nonsense. We're actually inside the world, and we're uh, asking different questions. Uh, one of the guys who picked up on this out of quantum theory was uh, John Wheeler. When, when Einstein died, he said, well, gee, who's going to be the pope of science? And he said, well, Wheeler, Wheeler. <laughs> he, said, I, he said, I will not wear the mantle of Einstein. And so, you know, Kip Thorne and uh, Feynman were his students, so he yeah, had incredible guy. And he really argued for this participatory universe idea. There's a great essay called, uh, we printed a couple of his books, Observership is Genesis. He said, unless you have an observer, unless you have this collapse of the wave function, you don't have any universe, so don't talk to me about this all going around. So, um, and, uh, so the, the inquirer is no longer a detached observer. The inquirer is actually part of the universe. So inquiry is one of the things that's involved in collapsing the wave function. And then it's this not wonderful little uh, thing of his, the universe looking itself into existence. Uh, and I always like this quote. So Wolfgang Pauli was one of Heisenberg's buddies, and, and uh, they were doing this. And he, he really captured, he said, in the new pattern of thought, 
We do not assume any longer the detached observer, occurring in the idealizations of this classical type of theory, but an observer who is by his indeterminate effects, indeterminate existential, indeterminate, indeterminable effects, creates a new situation theoretically described as a new state of the observed system, so in which he's contained. Okay, so that is my last sequence here. And I want to get to this because this is the core of the thermodynamic argument. That, that the reason the thing is going to get system science out of science and into engineering is the realization of the thermodynamics. And to go back to the Popper's question, what kind of phenomena would prove to you, prove to you that, that the universe is not a okay. And the answer is thermodynamics. Thermodynamics has irreducible irreversibility in it. Okay? Irreducible irreversibility in non-uniformity is part of the is built in. Okay? So, so th thermodynamic, the demonstration of thermodynamic phenomena, and if they're not reducible to mechanics, is what proves that the universe, that this whole scientific view is not right. Okay, so, and I say this is this is what happened in 17th, 18th century uh, engineering in France was the best version of the engineering worldview since Plato. And uh, they developed, most of it developed in, in France, and uh, again, most of that at the Ecole Polytechnique, which is, is characterized as the first engineering university, like systems engineering university. And I think it really was. Uh, and most of the names on the Eiffel, engraved on the Eiffel Tower, the Eiffel Tower, all these names embedded there, they're all associated, almost all of them, 90% of them, are associated with the Ecole Polytechnique, and they're all engineers. Okay? So France was into this. So, now, what happens a little bit before, 50 years earlier than what takes off in the football team, this guy Leibniz, and Leibniz introduces a new concept, the concept of dynamics. This is one of those semantic things that really can be misleading. Because the modern physicists talk about dynamics, they just mean movement in time or something like that, geometry plus time. Um, but Leibniz introduces something very different. And what it led to initially was this, what's called the vis viva controversy. Okay, and the question is, if I'm gonna have a mechanics, if I'm gonna have a geometry, I have to have something that's conserved. So when I go from when I put together uh, isosceles triangles or something, there's always something that's conserved, okay? Conservation of energy, conservation of mass, conservation of whatever you want. There's gotta be something conserved. And so what you realize is there's two the time there are two ongoing claims. One is that it is mv, which is like momentum, and the other is mv squared. And this comes because, I mean, Descartes, Descartes dominated everything, and then, and then Newtonian physics comes up and goes, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> mv squared. Maybe it's mv squared. <laughs> so initially, the contrary is being mv and mv squared. And uh, so what is conserved? And Leibniz enigmatic answers answer to something like both. Or an element of both, an irreducible element of both, like you say. And this introduces what I call a new theory of change. So from now on, change is now dualistic. Now to get hold of this, if I say to you, like the Bo the Roy's idea of waves and particles, is there is no purely particle experiment or purely wave experiment. Everything you do has an element of energy. Okay, and this is really the essence of Leibniz's claim. Okay, so. Uh, now, 50 years later, the vis viva controversy reemerges with this guy, Mopartoy, who's a big deal, he's in a powerful position here. Anyway. And he sees that he's dealing with two different mechanics. There's the mechanic, the Cartes mechanics, which is very nice, uh, algebraic geometry sort, uh, and, and then there's this Newtonian thing. And, and Mopartoy is credited with being the first uh, on the continent to bring, to take Newton seriously and bring him into Consideration. So he sees this uh, conflict. And so he introduces, or reintroduces, I say, because it's all there in, in Leibniz. But he introduces this idea of dualistic change. And, and it, it, he has to invent a oops, he has to invent a concept for this, a new concept of change, which he calls an action. Okay. Actions are always dual. Okay. Actions are dualistic. So uh, this is a new theory of change. Instead of being Instead of being in mechanics, changes from one unique situation to you know this situation, you 
determines this issue. This state determines the subject state. Not the case with this change. This change is always dualistic. So, and what I would say is, there's always somewhere a little bit of each. Okay. So, all action is there's an irreducible aspect of both. And these are complementary components. MB and MB squared are complementary. So, action is a post-mechanical concept because it's composed of two complementary mechanics. Same as what I just said about quantum theory. Quantum theory cannot be a mechanics because it has two uh, different mechanics in it that are not that don't fit together. Same thing with action in general. So all of all Leibnizian type dynamic theories have uh, opposite complementary mechanical components. So you have these mechanics and they're great, but they're always if you're doing it with just one or just the other, you're doing a major idealization. It's okay. It works. Quantum theory is a dynamic theory, uh, not a more uh, general classical mechanical theory. And that's what I say about George uh, Mobus's comment that system science is more general science. No, George, it's not, because you've got this linear and nonlinear things going on, and they do not fit together, and it can't be a science, because if it's a science, there'd have to be a function up there which you could derive these two complementary components. You can't, it doesn't work. So system engineering, I argue, is a dynamic theory, uh, not a more general scientific theory. Now, so Max Planck, essentially the founder of quantum work on black body radiation, he starts to see this. He, he works out, the way he works out black body radiation is he inter interpolates two opposite uh, theories of light, the, the particle theory and the wave theory. He puts them together, which is impossible, but he does it anyway. Come to this thing. And, and so, although action was pretty much ignored by the scientific community, the classical mechanical guys, it reemerges in quantum theory. And Planck doesn't miss this at all. Planck recognizes that Maupertuis' uh, idea of action is the same as the action in his quantum of action. Same thing, has the same parameters and everything. So, and, and this book, this wonderful book by Yergao uh, uh, and, and Mando Sam, they write this book and they said the only reason we wrote this book is because they're just troubled by Planck's obsession with this connection with uh, uh, with, uh, with Maupertuis, and it, which he later is is clarified that it's actually Leibniz who came up with the idea of action first. He says, Planck is obsessed with this connection. And Planck says, I really need to go back and look at this idea of action if you're going to understand quantum theory, which I agree with, of course. And this is, I've already said this. So, again, what, you know, famous, ridiculously often, often quoted that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, uh, you don't understand quantum mechanics. Uh, so this is Feynman. He, I think he made that statement when he was getting his Nobel Prize. And uh, what I think he's saying is what I said. He's, he's just saying it's not. A, if you think you can understand as a scientific theory, it's not. You can't. It doesn't work. Sorry. Um, but as a time of uh, experimental <laughs> physicist friend of mine talked about all this philosophical stuff, this is really great. And he says, uh, and he says to me, you know, he says, he says Terry, you're like, I don't even understand the theory in order to use it. It's very important. But anyway, so. Uh, so, uh, think Maupertuis has this wonderful thing where he talks about MV and MV squared. He has it about orbits, and he says the creation of a regular orbit uh, is like a solution to an engineering problem. Okay, so it's an optimization. You know, I don't know if you guys way back in Sputnik days they used to have these little little uh, games on your computer where you try to launch a satellite into a regular orbit. Not easy. I mean, you're going, whoa, it goes way out, comes back and crashes. You get a regular orbit, it's a hard thing. You have to the right velocity, you have to go into the right angle, I everything's mean, really amazing. So that's kind of what Moe Portrait seems. Orbits are, are, are like that. They're, they're like an engineering. And they, so there's the reason, so actions for him are also doings for reasons. And uh, so all, you know, he wants to say all structures, even this stable in the universe is composed of these things that are like orbits, they have this optimized, uh, uh, if you like, cyclic character of the, of the components. So, well, Leibniz had all this stuff before. And, and, and Leibniz' concept of action came from his dynamics. Uh, this has led to a huge priority controversy with Maupertuis, which was very brutal and not fun. But, so, to understand, so what, what Leibniz says, to understand the technological structures and functions of reality, you need to seek their intelligent reasons. This comes out of what he calls the principle of sufficient reason. 
understand something, why it is, it doesn't work, or it is, is it something that's been created? It had to have a reason. The principle of sufficient reason, fundamental to life. And then he goes on further, he says, he says let us, uh, argues for a post, not non-uniformitarian, but post-uniformitarian, some of each. And he's kind of just, his critique is the principle of identity of indiscernibles. He said if the universe was uniform, you couldn't tell anything from anything else. Everything's the same. So this is ridiculous. So he comes up with this principle of identity of indiscernibles. So, um, and also the, well, another part of Leibniz is, is he's essentially saying it's always works to the good, which was what, what Timaeus said. And Simon says what engineers do is they're always trying to do something to make things better. That's just they're by nature. And so he comes up with this idea that, best, that it's always the best of all possible worlds. It doesn't mean it's the best of all possible worlds forever and everywhere. It means it's constantly the best of all possible worlds. Because everything we're doing is as best we could. We just give it a try, but it's still the best. And he, and he, he, he allows for errors and all that sort of stuff. So, and uh, Leibniz has this organismic engine ontology, he thinks the universe is an organism. Uh, he has a hydro, hydro, hydraulico pyrotechnic engine. This is it's a it's a metabolic organism. Right? Uh, and, and then he says any any machine or any engine is best understood by its final final cause. It's a sufficient reason. And he wants to say in, uh, reality is an engine composed of engines. So it's engines all the way down. I notice that Mobus says that systems is systems all the way down, but systems, and it's the same if you agree that systems are engineers. Very right, uh, yeah, in the engineering thing. So, uh, so he's a dynamic equilibrium, and so his main thing to understand is that the two different types of symmetries, two different types of equilibrium. So in Newtonian type mechanical equilibrium, uh, every action is equal to reaction. Static, it doesn't go anywhere. Okay, there's always happening, same time, same place. So it's a static equilibrium. Okay, but in dynamics, the equilibrium, because the two different components of the action are not mechanically commensurable, okay, they're different, and so they're in this cycle. Okay, and these cycles generate. If you read, read Aristotle, he has a thing about it. everything that comes to be comes to be through cycles. So, anyway. Everything's a cycle. The biosphere, I mentioned the thing about the Gaia thing. I don't know if I mentioned this. So Gaia thing, the reason that the, the Earth is in it is, on the one hand, it's in, it's in this homostatic equilibrium. Okay? And, and, and just like your body, you have all these homostasis going on. But that doesn't tell me everything about you. If that was just it, it's, I'm totally homostatic, you're just totally static. So you got this homostatic thing. You also have this far from equilibrium component. So I'm far from equilibrium on the one hand, and I'm, I'm, I have this other type of equilibrium at the same time. So that's what this is all about. People hang on. So three minutes. Um, so uh, Lazar Carnot, he's my big hero. So Lazar really tries to formulate an engineering worldview. He starts coming out. He says, I notice that there are no engineers in the rational mechanics worldview, the scientific worldview. He says, where are the engineers? And where's engineering practice? Uh, it's not there. And then he goes on. He's, uh, explicitly, uh, and he wants to go to a more general worldview in which there are engineers. So, okay, so, so in Carnot, you see this with the, in Saadi Carnot's uh, famous first essay in thermodynamics. You, you see these cycles: the cycle up and the cycle down are complementary. And what is produced? What's produced is the work. The area in that between those is work. Work is what is created and persists and doesn't go away. And uh, you notice this is not your basic Cartesian graph. You know, like things going off by continuously. This is a cycle, folks. And the cycle is productive. Okay, just ignore it by the same thing. Okay, and, and, and Carnot makes a formal argument, which is really fascinating. He says there's a well known principle of engineering practice. And it's a lose in velocity and time uh, what we gain in power. This is sort of thing. I, I can I can raise this weight directly, or I can use a pulley. Okay, but I use a pulley is going to be a little slower. Okay, but I can go. I have and the main thing is what he's saying here is I have options. Okay, so and he said first of all he says no rational mechanics can account for this engineering principle. And it, what he's saying is that engineers have options in accomplishing a task. 
Now they're constrained, of course, but they can do it one way, they can do it another way. So they have this, that's what is involved in this trade-off. Okay, time, velocity. So, uh, and, and because of this, the fact that they have options, they have to choose. Choice is a necessity. So whatever you do as an engineer, you're forced to choose. This is the existential thing. Yeah. <laughs> existential is like, I don't, I don't even have to choose that I'm choosing. I choose by my nature. Okay. A lot of guys like existential. Is like, I don't want to choose. No, you choose any. You choose not to choose. That's choosing. So, uh, so uh, engineers have this constrained free will. And in Lazar's participant engineering, the path to the future is always partially determined. So as I'm an engineer. What's going to happen in the future depends on my choices. Okay, so something I'm just constrained, of course, well, but I always have options. Uh, and the engineer's actions, if you think of this in terms of, or, or what actualize the potential to bring about a particular um, historical future. And, and again, analogies uh, collapsing the wave function in uh, quantum theory. This, it, the reason I got screwed up is it, you can't do it mechanically, it doesn't work. What you need is an action, you need something that's a choice. You want the particle thing or you want the wave thing? Okay, so uh, real engineering is an optimizing path between the like, particle and wave. Between these uh, complementary options, there's, there's is, is the path that engineering takes. And I was, I was trying to call it the middle way between these. Uh, about uh, <clears throat> thermodynamics, you know, there's a difference between path dependent and path independent. Uh, change. A path dependent is state to state to state, and actually there's no time between those states. Uh, it's like you go up the mountain, you go to one level, you go to another level, that's all they talk about. How you get there, it doesn't matter. Well, in Nigeria, it matters how you get there. It matters. Uh, we have to go back and reshare the story. So, all right, let's okay. go. So, those of you, there's a, in, in thermodynamics, I mean, you're taking a path dependent, path independent. The whole mechanical approach to thermodynamics is path independent. And that's wonderful, but everybody knows the path dependence is deal. Path dependence simply means that you have to take into account the amount of time that you take to get from one state to the other, which is ignored in path independence. So that's what uh, Carnot's adding for one sense. And what he does is really, and I think he goes beyond Leibniz in this, he, he takes this from, it's called the principle of least action, which is deterministic, Euler and Lagrange and all that, to a principle of optimization. Principle of optimization is simply says, I as an engineer, I'm constantly faced with these options, and I have to decide which one I'm going to do. And when I'm designing something, I have to decide. It's always trade-offs. It's always, and I always think that I try to see that the engineering decision-making systems engineering is a middle way. It's always between alternatives. And if you're not doing between alternatives, you're probably not looking at your options properly. So there's an Euler Lagrange principle of least action which doesn't work because it's totally deterministic. Um, so I think I've already said this stuff. Well, I'm saying, so anyway, I would say the proper understanding, number three, proper understanding of quantum theory is, uh, um, is a participant engineering thermodynamic theory. So everybody knew from the beginning that quantum theory was a participant theory until they tried to get rid of the participant. So it's really a participant. The other thing is it's not a mechanical theory. Quantum mechanics is not a mechanical theory. And the reason it isn't because it's a thermodynamic theory. It has these components that have been outlined by the proper understanding of thermodynamics. Okay, these are all review things, so I don't think I need to do those. Okay, so I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> it was so close. <laughs> yeah, you were so close. <laughs> well, it, it, it's late. I'm going to let people go, but before I go, I'll put, paste. Uh, Terry says, please feel free to give me comments and questions via email. Uh, he's interested in yeah. receiving them, but just tr doing them now is not, not going to work. So I'll put his email. Wait, you got a lunch date or what? <laughs> I'll take questions now. Do you want to shut everything down? Um, let me ask the group. Group, please help us out here. Should we call it good and do the Q&A asynchronously, or should we go ahead and do a QA and a right now? Just uh, put it in chat, because that's what I'm watching. I'm, I, I'm on my little tiny phone, so I don't get to see everything. So just chat in there and say, keep going or or, or wait. Or if anybody, later, if or anybody has an immediate question, they could. Well, there was a question way back that I have in chat, which was, I'll just read it. Seems to me that engineering versus science view is identical to the physical slash social or psychological science differences in phenomena study. One has to take an evolutionary view, and you talk about that, 
of the phenomena and build a view of how values evolve in, or, in organic systems to explain engineering activities or other behavior of living things. Terry, how do you respond to that? Well, you know, he's right, and, and but I, w I don't separate those anymore. That's Steve Staloff, just to put a name with who made that comment a long time ago at the beginning okay, of your talk. Okay, okay, he's right on. It's a very good question. And the main thing is, is that these two separate things, the psychological and the physical, become one when you're inside the system, okay? When, you know, this is the old Descartes thing about the mind and the body. The mind and the body thing disappears in engineering just like uh, the difference between sciences and humanities disappears. Because all of a sudden, because I'm inside the system, I have to, to understand the system, I'm understanding myself at the same time. So I am, in fact, an agent. I am, uh, 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 you know, what's going on, I'm what's doing, doing. So everything, I mean, one of the implications of this is consciousness is everything. Everything is social. Everything is, you know, the, 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 we're not throwing out the mechanics. We're just saying the mechanics are so all... we're trying to unify everything rather than cut them into different pieces or something. Well, the main thing is we're not, I, I, we're going to stop separating what he's calling the social psychological stuff from the physical. That's what I think that was a point. Yeah. What I want to say is when you go to the engineering view, these actually become the same thing. So everything, I've mean, given a couple other talks, if you can look on my on YouTube, uh, about what is the ultimate context of engineering in this. It's a value context. So really the ultimate issues of engineering are about values. So certainly they're about, about uh, uh, you know, social, what he's calling social and psychological stuff. The question then, if you take that, is well, where does the physical come into this? Well, the physical comes in when you get the right thermodynamics and, and everybody gets into that. Leibniz gets it, so forth. So anyway, I just say it's a good question, but the answer is that these, in the engineering uh, framework, these come together. Just like the things that have been separated, like mind and body are no longer separate. Because I am my mind, I am my body. That whole, that whole mind-body separation is artificial, and it comes from trying to understand things in terms of mechanics, in terms of, of this uh, physical scientific worldview. And it's simply, both of them are incomplete. And they don't right. work together. So in engineering, they come together. Does that help? Everybody it helps. Questions? And most of the votes are saying it's time to go. Okay. We'll do it later. So I have All promised. Right. I'll put Terry's email address into the chat before I finish the recording. And then, of course, this recording will be made uh, publicly available uh, through whatever vehicles oh we want to do. Oh, my God. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for coming very much. Thanks for the very, very challenging and interesting talk. Challenging in the sense of challenging. All, all of us found something that shook us a little Somebody bit. Somebody said to me, is like, too many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of ideas to work with. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. I'm going to go in the other room just because I have more control over pasting things into chat right. than I do on right. my phone. All right. Do you have any live questions? Yeah, I have questions. So, like, this is actually a really well-timed talk because Good. in academia... You're stuck in the scientific worldview, and everybody else is using the scientific worldview. And so, if you are a person who is a change agent, how do you communicate with people what needs to be changed, and how do you make those things happen? Well, the first thing I was just Wayne and I were—I've been hanging out with the system science folks for forever, and uh, talking to Wayne about what's going to happen with system science department. And I said a long time ago that. Portland State was missing. It had one of the few, you know, systems PhDs, forget the science word, in the nation, and they had the opportunity to build this. And the problem became that they insisted on being a science. Right. And one of the things that we were talking about, I said, Wayne, you ought to be an engineer. You ought to, guys, uh, if you're going to transition, you should transition into engineering. Oh, maybe we're going to go into health or something. No, yeah. systems is engineering. And what mm -hmm. system science, if you go over to engineering, you know, I've, t I've presented at a few engineering conferences, and a lot of the engineers just go like, of course, we knew all this. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, and again, this, <coughs> this complete disconnect between the engineers and the sci engineering and science. Scientists just don't want to know about, <coughs> know about the engineering stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't commute. It doesn't uh, translate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the, the engineering guys, it's like, we've been said, yeah, well, you know, we're not against science, it's great. It comes up with these nice tools and everything. There's a really nice book out now, interesting, uh, by this one, uh, Chiara Marletto, M-A-R-L-E-T-T-O. It's called The Science of Can and Can't. And what she's doing is, is kind of along the lines of what Smolin's doing, but 
you know, what she's doing is she's saying, wait a minute, science is not, this whole idea that it's like this determines that uniquely. No, she's what science tells us is what we can do and what we can't do. Right. Okay, this is like, I see like she's into engineering here. Okay, right. because that's what the sciences are. The sciences are tools. They teach you how to do this, you know, like, oh, what are you thinking about? Uh, Einstein's general relativity. Oh, everything's determined. The universe is already ended and we're just time. No, it allows you to do GPS right. <laughs> and to synchronize things. <laughs> oh, wasn't everything synchronized before? Actually, no, it wasn't. Right. So, but that, I mean, basically what she's trying to say is that the sciences, I don't think it's quite as aggressive as I would want her to be, but what she's saying is the sciences are actually um, giving us tools. And so it, it forces you to say, well, what is scientific inquiry then? Okay. And, and my friend Henry Petrosky, who's, who's written a lot in philosophy and engineering at Duke University, and, and Henry's deal is like, um, first of all, he says, well, everything, everything you thought was science is actually engineering. You have to think about this, because if the world is this deterministic thing, what the hell is a question? Why is knowledge important? I mean, it's all deterministic anyway. What the hell? This is completely pointless. I, I, I talk, talking about this is what science as a worldview is not uh, self-referentially coherent. Mm -hmm. It can't make sense of itself. Okay? Mm -hmm. It can't make sense of why are we, what is science? What are we doing? In science? It doesn't make any sense. And the early philosophy of science guys came out with this idea of logical positivism. Logical, and it, it took, those guys, it took them about three years to like abandon it. But it caught on with the scientific community. Oh, yes, logical positive, we're doing that. And Kuhn came along and said, no, it doesn't work that way. But you have to come up with, assuming it's not all that easy, is, is what is inquiry in the engineering view? And one, one friend of mine says, well, look, you have to realize that everything you do uh, is doing something that's also an inquiry. Say, so, is this going to work this time? Or is it you know, like not? There's always an uncertainty in there. And insofar as there's uncertainty, it is... Uh, it's an inquiry, okay? So you're learning that way, but it's also possible to do... Uh, uh, I left the recording going because why not? People can always turn it off. All right, that's good. <laughs> Herman's still here. I, I don't know. Now there's several people still in the room. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I don't know, does that help? I think so, yeah. 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 So you should be in engin systems engineering. Or you can be in system science and then realize you're actually systems engineering. Right, well, I mean, really, I'm just here at PSU wanting to, wanting things to change, right? And yeah. so you are in the system and you want to see things change, but like the problem is communicating with other humans within the academic domain is like yeah. almost impossible because and even like you get into statistics and you see, like you think, oh, statistics is going to be all quantum mechanical, but then it's <laughs> not because yeah. it's governed by all these rules. Yeah. And so how do you make arguments that you can't explain to other people in? Well, part of it is, I think there are a lot of people in the science community <coughs> who understand this. Right. <coughs> Favorites, John Barrow, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote, he, unfortunately, just, he was a good buddy and he died young, too young, uh, he had a cancer. But he's written a whole series of books, and I highly recommend it. One, the one called The Artful Universe is really, uh -huh. really good. And... Uh, which is really the artful universe, artful, you might say the engineering universe. Uh -huh. and he talks about all of these trade offs, all these, you know, how can, why aren't we bigger? Well, because we would, you know, crush down and all that. You know, and you see, you see that all these structures and functions have uh, reasons for them. They're complements, okay? Mm -hmm. They have, and they're optimizations. And, and he said, I think I mentioned before, he says in his deal, he says, like, uh, the people are doing multiverses and all that sort of stuff. There's such a bozos because they don't want to talk about the fine tuning. They don't want to talk about this stuff. Right. It doesn't fit into their thing. So you say, how do I talk to those people? I know David Wallace who goes multiple universes. And I go, David, you're nuts. And he's like, oh, you don't understand. You know, like, but I mean, they're, they're, it, it, is it a problem? Yeah, it's a problem. I mean, I, when I got to this, going back, one of the discouraging things you go back and say, well, like, Carnot had this right. in 1800. I go, like, what have we been doing since then? And then, and the other thing is, go back to Plato, and you, I'm just blown away by the amount of stuff. I mean, Whitehead said that one. He said, you know, like, um, you say, uh, 20th century philosophy is is nothing more than a, a footnote to Plato. 
There's a lot to that. You go back and replay it. Timaeus is really hard to understand. It has a lot to do with Pythagorean stuff. But it is one of the things in, that I would say, another guy, this guy, Julian Barber, okay. who talks about time. He had a bunch of on time, the end of time, and all sorts of stuff. And Barber really insists, he says, everything that you measure, everything that you measure in uh, science is actually a ratio. It's not an absolute value. You think you're measuring, oh, this is the absolute value. No, it's always a ratio. And I suspect that the ratios are, you know, because it's, they're optimized things, okay? And uh, there's a good thing by Alan Lightman about that. But um, ratios were fundamental to uh, Pythagoras. Okay, everything was, this is, you know, the guy with the, the right. yeah, <laughs> the harmonies, harmonies of the strings and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and he was thinking everything is ratios. Now, I don't think everything can be fit into one ratio thing, but I think the idea that ratios are fundamental is something that's been missed and underappreciated, if you like, and all this sort of stuff. So that's just a secondary thing. Who else to read? Uh, Paul Davies. Paul, uh, the Goldilocks thing is is, another, is kind of his version of uh, John Barrow's book. And it's just saying, you know, the, it's middle way. Goldilocks is between, you know, too hot, too cold. And uh, these guys, uh, I mean, I, I, I hung out with Hawking a lot, and and, uh, and I know Steven Weinberg and so on. These guys, they're, they're all going, oh, yeah, fine-tuning, anthropic principle. They're all kind of there, but then they don't know what to do with it. Right. Okay, so, and that's one of the big deals is, like, I don't think these people are going to roll over until you give them an alternative. And maybe not even then. So that's you know go to these engineering conferences and they just go like oh yeah, you know where I knew that. We're like yeah, but what about those guys? <laughs> they like, yeah, forget them. We don't care about them anyway. Uh, and they, they, uh, who's this guy? Uh, Dundar Kaglu. That's if you're looking around for a place to be. He's kind of an interesting guy. Um, has this uh, what's it called? Masters of Engineering and Technology. Uh huh. M M E T. Yeah, and he does this annual conference called uh, PICMET. Portland International Conference Management of Engineering and Technology. And these are the guys, these are real world people. He has people coming in there that are from, that are, you know, people like the head of, of research for IBM or for, you know, these guys, like, I always say it this way, okay, here you have, I'm giving you a $300 million budget. I want you to be creative, but you're accountable. <laughs> they're, all, they're always trying to figure out the, the, the worry is they're always trying to figure out the accountability part rather than the creative part. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it, that's where I, pre I presented a couple times at that conference. And it's really, uh, it's a group of uh, uh, people who are, I think, you know, these people, there are a lot of people that are thinking in terms of what I've been talking about here. But the universities are dominated by this, by this scientific mentality. And it's, it's horrible. There's, uh, who's this woman, uh, Deborah Mayo. We are talking about statistics. She's doing stuff about, you can look her up, Deborah Mayo. I think she's at LSE, University of London. But she's really going after this. I, there's, there's the whole p-values and everything like that. Right. And the big assumption in that, that these are objective things, numbers that we're measuring, you know, which, right. and it's not that it doesn't work in some cases a little bit. That's the problem with it. It's like, like, and, and, and there's a lot of literature on the difference between approximation and idealization. Uh, I think this book by uh, Batterman, which I quite like, it's really a, it's a collection of essays, but uh, Batterman's thing is, is called The Devils in the Details. And he really goes after, he says, well, like, look, we know that the classical scientific model isn't, doesn't work. So how are we going to explain these regularities? Okay. And what turns out is like you have to get to, you know, like why is the Earth a sphere? And like, so if I go around, gravity's the same, all is regular, you know. Like, so there are regularities in how, do, how does anything form? How, what is an object? There's no reason from the standard, you know, entropic expansion of the universe, there's no reason there should be anything formed. I mean, it's just, you know, and, and, and it actually goes in the exact opposite direction, forms stars, which is really hot things in a very cold space. That's that's an increase in your in your gradients. It's supposed to be going gradients are supposed to be going away. And then I gave this talk in Russia a couple of years ago. I said, and then 
inside these stars and then they collapse and when they collapse down in 15 minutes, literally 15 minutes, just super high pressure, super high temperature, they create all these elements up to up to iron anyway. And then they like spew them out through you. Now they were created in this high temperature and high pressure thing. So you'd expect as they go out there in cold space, they're going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. But they don't. Now what is that? I mean, these guys have no explanation of at all. They're just completely... Going on. So there, oh, I know another one you should look at. Uh, Sabine Hoffenfelter. Hoffenfelter, I think. Hoffenfelter. She's really challenging stuff. And Lee Smolin uh, is really good. He's at the Perman Institute. And Smolin and this guy uh, Unger. Uh, Unger is actually a, a law professor at Harvard. And Unger and Smolin did a book together. And, and Unger pushes it in a way that Smolin doesn't quite get. But Unger pushes pragmatism. And I always call pragmatism as an early version of philosophy of engineering. And there's a lot of connections between philosophy and engineering. I don't like to use the word pragmatism generally because there's so much commentary on pragmatism. Oh, I know what pragmatism means. No, it means this. No, it means that. Oh, this is what you're... So I don't even bother with it. It's like... But, I mean, so I tell people, I think there's a huge number of things in pragmatism that are fundamental to philosophy of engineering. And another question is, why isn't pragmatism more dominant in modern philosophy? Right. Same reasons. <laughs> it didn't fit into the mechanical and scientific worldview. Well, in some academic writing, they'll tell you you can't use um, analogies. And you're like, no, I need the analogies. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not going to work without analogies. I know. And it's the whole thing about, about what is it, one that we were always saying about anthropomorphism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask, is anybody out there, Parker or uh, <clears throat> Percy, wants to ask a question, we'll pause for a second. You can unmute your microphone and ask if you'd like. If nobody's yeah, just at do that it. point, that's fine too. Just do it. <laughs> we'll, we'll shut up here if you want. Yeah, you know, there, there are people out there, and there's more and more uh, Sabine, office, often filter or anything. You'll find her. She has a whole bunch of uh, YouTube videos too that she's putting up. She's just going like, these guys are just full of shit. I mean, that's, that's really what she's saying. She can't believe that they're telling us that this is an explanation for this. this is like Why don't we listen to physicists at all, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the problem. No, this is the problem because they're not completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Of course okay. not. What we need is the bigger tent that, it, that gets us in, back into the universe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And this is do, one of Dewey's things that I really quite like. I'm just going to mm -hmm. think I'm going to do a presentation on this in April. And Dewey talks about two representations of inquiry. The spectator representation of inquiry and the participant. Now the spectator one is like, so what I want to know is I want to know the laws governing the objective universe out there. I'm not. Okay. This is the God perspective, really. Well, you it's, want it's, to say like you have control over things, right? Well, you're not going to know. This is no, you're not even interacting with it. Somehow you're getting information, but we don't worry about it. The accounting for that. So the the, the uh, the uh, it's a spectator thing. It's, I'll call it what what Pauli called the detached observer assumptions of classical mechanics. You're detached, so you're looking for those laws out there. Now, if you're a, so, and one thing you can't disturb it because if you actually go in and disturb it, then you're never going to figure out what the hell the laws are. Right. You can must muck it up, so you can't interact with it. I mean, mm -hmm. you just can't. I mean, maybe you can receive something by it, but you can't. You know. The other one, the participant one, it's not just that you're interacting with it. You're in the universe. Mm -hmm. And so you're, and here's what one of my revelations was, they're asking different types of question. Okay, so the participant is, roughly speaking, the, the, uh, the spectator is saying, how does the universe work out there? The participant is saying, how do I work in the universe? Of course, he needs to know stuff like, how does it, how is the universe working right now? So I can do so. What is the structure? There's a mountain over there. I want to run my airplane into the mountain. So I want to know. So we want to know about all these stable, regular aspects, but they're just, you know, uh, limited constraints within my ability to do things in the world. Right. I'm totally sympathetic with you as far as like, what do you do? I mean, it's just like, uh. <laughs> I mean, I was talking to my wife about it. She said, what are you doing? It's like, I, I said, this is like this incredible detective story. It's like, how did we ever get to this point? I mean, it's just absurd so